Before I take questions, I'd like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. This has been a, uh, one of the toughest years we've ever faced as a nation. And the pandemic, the economic crisis, the calls for racial justice, historic and punishing wildfires and storms. So this season of reflection carries a much deeper meaning than it usually does. Over 320,000 lives lost to this virus. And Jill and I send our prayers, as I'm sure all of you do, to all who are facing this dark winter with an empty seat at the dinner table uh, where a loved one used to sit and talk and laugh and reminisce. Our hearts go out to all of you who have fallen on hard times through no fault of your own, I might add. Unable to sleep at night, weighed down with the worry of what tomorrow will bring for you and for your family. We're especially grateful for the healthcare workers on the front lines, the scientists, the researchers, the clinical trial participants on the front lines of the vaccine who deserve uh, our thanks and who delivered us scientific breakthrough. And for all of you who have deployed family, deployed family members in the military, we know what it's like. We know what that experience is like, how difficult it can be, especially at this time of the year. Our family knows your sacrifice, and our hearts are always with you. But keep the faith. Throughout this year, we had to forego many of our favorite holiday traditions. We have, have as families, as communities, and as a country. For the Bidens, we usually have 20 to 25 family members over for Christmas dinner, and then the immediate family, 14 of our kids and grandkids and their spouses uh, for uh, coming down the stairs on Christmas morning, but not this year. Like we did over Thanksgiving, we all have to care enough for each other that we have to stay apart just a little bit longer. I know it's hard. We have a long way to go, but we're grateful that we've got the vaccine. And yesterday, in an effort to instill some confidence in the vaccine, I had my shot administered in public. And I got a chance to thank all those nurses and docs at Christiana Hospital for what they've been putting up with and doing for so long. I look forward to the second shot, and I have absolute confidence in the vaccine. But we're in short supply. Taking the vaccine from a vial into the arm of millions of Americans is one of the biggest operational challenges the United States has ever faced for 300 million people. And we're going to take many more months for that to happen. In the meantime, this pandemic rages on. Experts, experts say things are going to get worse before they get better, notwithstanding the fact we have the vaccine. As you all know, we're averaging a death rate of close to 3,000 people a day. That means we're going to lose tens of thousands of more lives in the months to come. And the vaccine won't be able to stop that. So we'll still have to remain vigilant. We need everyone to mask up, stay socially distanced, avoid large gatherings, particularly inside. We need to work in a bipartisan way that's the only way we're going to get through this in tough times. And we have our first hint and glimpse of bipartisanship. I applaud the Congress, their economic relief package that included funding for vaccine distribution, much needed temporary relief for workers, families, and small businesses. In this election, the American people made it clear they want us to reach across the aisle and work together on matters of national concern to get something done. And I believe that to be the case from the very beginning of my campaign. And I'm happy to see members of Congress heeding that message as well from their own constituents. Leaders in both House and Senate, both parties, deserve credit for making the hard compromises to get this done. But like all compromises, it's far from perfect. But it does provide vital relief at a critical moment. However, as I've said all along, this bill is just the first step, a down payment, in addressing the crisis, the crises, more than one that we're in. There's a lot more work to do. Early next year, I'm going to put forward to the Congress my plans for what comes next. We'll need more help, 
to fully distribute the vaccine. We're going to need more testing in order to be able to open our schools. We're going to need more funding to help firefighters and police, many of whom are being laid off as I speak. And the same with nurses risking their lives on the front lines. The same for millions of hurting families who are unable to put food on the table, pay rent or the mortgage. Unemployment is extended for another 10 weeks. It's going to take a lot longer than that. But Congress did its job this week. And I can and I must ask them to do it again next year. But even with the changes in approach I'm going to put in place in late January, people are still going to be getting sick and dying from COVID. One thing I promise you about my leadership during this crisis, I'm going to tell it to you straight. I'm going to tell you the truth. And here's the simple truth. Our darkest days in the battle against COVID are ahead of us, not behind us. So we need to prepare ourselves to steal our spines, as frustrating as it is to hear, it's going to take patience, persistence, and determination to beat this virus. There will be no time to waste in taking the steps we need to turn this crisis around. My administration will start to do this its part on our first day in office with masking requirements, a new strategy for testing, accelerated protection, protective gear. And we're going to challenge Congress and the American people to step up immediately as well to do their part. As with the relief bill passed by Congress, there's another challenge which my administration will confront on a bipartisan basis, a massive cybersecurity breach against the U.S. companies, many of them, as well as federal agencies. And there's still so much we don't know including the full scope of the breach or the extent of the damage it has caused. But we know this much. This attack constitutes a grave risk to our national security. It was carefully planned and carefully orchestrated. It was carried out by using sophisticated cyber tools. The attackers succeeded in catching the federal government off guard and unprepared. Foreign actors have been working this breach since last, late last year, at least last year, setting the landscape to compromise our systems, scraping up sensitive information from our world-class tech sector and from private businesses and from United States government agencies. The truth is this. The Trump administration failed to prioritize cybersecurity. It did that from eliminating or downgrading cyber coordinators in both the White House and at the State Department, to firing the Director of Cyber Space and Infrastructure Security Agency, to President Trump's irrational downplaying of the seriousness of this attack. Enough's enough. In an age when so much of our lives are conducted online, cyber attacks must be treated as a serious threat by our leadership at the highest levels. We can't let this go unanswered. That means making clear and publicly who is responsible for the attack and taking meaningful steps to hold them in account. Initial indications, including from Secretary Pompeo, Secretary of State, and Attorney General William Barr, suggest that Russia, Russia is responsible for this breach. It certainly fits Russia's long history of reckless, disruptive cyber activities. But the Trump administration needs to make an official attribution. This assault happened on Donald Trump's watch when he wasn't watching. It's still his responsibility as president to, to defend American interests for the next four weeks. But rest assured that even if he does not take it seriously, I will. Well, I'm disappointed by the response of President Trump. I was pleased to see leaders in both parties in the Congress speak out loudly and clearly on this attack. Again, I want to thank prominent Republicans in the Senate, particularly for speaking out. It's a sign, a sign that with a new administration, we can confront these threats on a bipartisan basis with a united front here at home. 
That should be encouraging to the American people and a warning to our adversaries. In the meantime, the President's team for the next four weeks need to cooperate fully, which they haven't been doing, to share information that becomes available on both the impact and our response to ensure a smooth transition to protect the American people as administrations change. Over the next month, I intend to continue focusing on building my team so that the right people are in place on day one of my administration to take over this effort, to prioritize cybersecurity across the board. And I'll consult with experts to plan for the steps that my administration will take in order to secure our systems, improve our cyber defenses, and to better withstand future attacks that we know will come, and to impose costs on those who conduct them. And I fully expect bipartisan support from this based on what we've heard so far. Our adversaries are highly capable. Cyber threats are among the greatest threats to our global security in the 21st century. And I believe we have to treat them with the same seriousness of purpose that we treated threats of other unconventional weapons. We have to work with our allies to establish clear international rules and mechanisms to enforce them and consequences for those countries that violate them. I want to close with this. As I look at the first of what will be millions of vaccinations going in the arms of Americans after hundreds of thousands of lives lost, a Congress finally passing an economic relief package after months and months of delay, and a new urgency for a bipartisan's approach to cybersecurity after years of a president who refused to stand up to our adversaries and hold them accountable. I'm reminded of a quote this season from a Jesuit priest named Alfred Delp. He wrote, quote, Advent is a time for rousing. Delp believed at first we are shaken to our depths, and then we're ready for a season of hope. As a nation, we've certainly been shaken to our depths this year. Now it's time to awaken, to get moving. Time for hope. We've gotten through tough times before in this nation. We'll get through these difficult times as well. And we'll do it by coming together, by working with one another, by being, you've heard me say many times, but we are at our best, the United States of America. There are certain things that rise way above partisan differences that threaten the United States. There are national security interests that require us to cooperate. And I'm confident, I'm confident we'll be able to do that. After a year of pain and loss, it's time to unite, to heal, to rebuild. And for all those who are suffering right now, who have had enormous loss, and will lie at wake at night wondering what tomorrow's bring, I'd say, well, God bless you all, and I promise you, we're going to continue to push as hard as we can to finish the job. May God bless you all. May God protect our troops. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to you all. And I'll be happy to take some questions. Megan, I'll let you tell me who's. Thank you, Mr. President-elect. President Obama once referred to this emerging cyber battlefield as the Wild West. President Trump, in commenting on this most recent breach, said the situation was well under control. Given what you just said about this, that it represents a grave risk, do you believe it also represents an act of war? And will you respond in kind if so? The answer is, first of all, it is a grave risk, and it continues. I see no evidence that it's under control. I see none. Heard of none. Defense Department won't even brief us on many things. So I know of nothing that suggests it's under control. This president hasn't even identified who is responsible yet. Number two, the question of the damage done remains to be determined. We have to look at very closely the nature of the breaches, how extensive they are, and what damage has been done. 
And thirdly, there's going to be a necessity, as, Barack, as President Obama and I and our administration talked about. We need international society, international rules of the road on cybersecurity. We have to bring along our allies and our friends so we hold everyone accountable who breaches any of these basic fundamental rules. And lastly, I believe that uh, when I learn the extent of the damage and, in fact, who is formally responsible, they can be assured that we will respond and probably respond in kind. There's many options which I will not discuss now. Why not lay out those kind of options publicly, though? Isn't part of the issue here deterrence and the fact that Russia felt some impunity if it is indeed Russia to do what they've done here? We have not done that in any other areas where we have faced international crises. We don't sit here and say that we are going to strike you with a nuclear weapon. We don't sit and we're going to say and so on. Let us determine what the extent of the damage is. And I promise you, there will be a response. On another issue, sir, as you know, the runoff elections in Georgia could well determine whether there's a Democratic Senate in January or a Republican Senate in January. Is the, are you waiting for the outcome of those two races to make some of the final selections for your cabinet, including uh, the Attorney General, the most significant outstanding uh, uh, cabinet secretary you have to pick? No, not based on the Attorney General. It's just a matter of getting to it and through it and being able to announce them all. They'll all be announced either just before or just after. We're going to make an announcement tomorrow, and we may have another announcement between then and Christmas, Christmas and New Year's. We're just working through all of the efforts to, uh, to do due diligence. And lastly, has the issue of the investigation uh, of your son come up in discussions with your team and with potential candidates about no. the Attorney General? No. I guarantee you I'm going to do what I said. The Attorney General of the United States of America is not the President's lawyer. I will appoint someone who I expect to enforce the law as the law is written, not guided by me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. President-elect. There is growing concern today about that new variant of uh, COVID-19 sweeping across the UK. Should the United States right now impose a travel ban on flights coming in from the UK? As you know, there already is one, unrelated to that finding that new strain, number one. And uh, the question is whether or not, uh, at the very least, it only allows Americans coming home to be able to come back to the States, citizens. One of the things I'm waiting to get a response from my COVID team is whether or not we should require testing before they get on an aircraft to fly home, number one, and number two, when they get home, should they quarantine? That's my instinct, but I'm waiting to hear from my experts right now. You talked about how you want to propose a new COVID relief plan when you do take office. Yes. It took more than six months for Congress to reach this new deal. Americans are suffering at this moment. How can you assure Americans that a relief will come and come soon. You all ask the most interesting questions. Have you ever known anyone in the history of the United States of America that could be president and assure exactly what the Congress is going to do? <laughs> so I can't assure anything, but I can tell you what I expect. I fully expect on those critical issues that we're facing, number one, being able to get all the work we need done and all the funding to be able to get that vaccine in everyone's arm, and that's 300 million people. We'll get that done because you're going to see that the responsibility has already been recognized by the Republicans and Democrats in the Congress because the, the constituency is going to demand it, number one. Number two, all those people are out there hurting, lost jobs and no fault of their own. They've extended unemployment for 10 weeks. Simply not sufficient. Necessary to get it done, to get through the holidays, but I predict you will get cooperation and get that done. I've been arguing from the very beginning and told how I, I love it. It makes me sound so much younger how naive I am uh, about how the Congress works. I think I've been proven right around, across the board. The things that are left to deal with, from employment to people needing unemployment insurance to the ability to have access to health care, the ability to get this, the treat, treatment for free, et cetera, 
All of that is something that the public is not going to stand for us not doing. And I think with Donald Trump not in the way, that will also enhance the prospect of things getting done. Will your plan include a new round of stimulus checks to the American people? And if yes. so, for how much? Well, look, that's a, that's a negotiating issue. But it will. Yes, it will. And I think, by the way, I think we uh, owe uh, Bernie Sanders and his Republican colleagues thanks for getting not all the stimulus we looked for, 1,200, but getting 600 done. So I think you're seeing that there is a clear understanding that these issues go beyond any ideology. People are desperately hurting, and the Republicans are hurting as badly as Democrats. There are a few people, and I'm not saying they're responsible for any of this, but a few people are doing extremely well in that K-shaped recovery, and they're, and, and they're doing fine. But they still need access to the vaccines. They still need access to making sure that we are able to handle crises in the hospitals, et cetera. So I think they're on the things relating to, A, vaccine distribution, which is going to cost billions more dollars. It's simply going to cost billions more dollars. We need national standards to lay out to help governors discern how they're going to get that vaccine throughout their, throughout their communities, number one. Number two, we're going to need to take care of those people who, through no fault of their own, are unemployed. They've worked like hell, but they have no job because of the COVID crisis. And thirdly, we're going to have to begin to rebuild the country. We can't wait. We can't wait to rebuild the economy. We're going to have to start doing that now on infrastructure programs and a whole range of other things. I think the uh, sort of the dawn is broken on the vast majority of people. There are still people who don't want to help. There are still people who are insisting my way or the highway. But the vast majority of the members of Congress, I believe, will be able to work out those, those uh, specific issues that are of national consequence. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. President-elect, thank you. Thank you. I'm still not sure if I heard you say specifically, though, sir, what is your ask of the Congress? In just one month's time, what is your ask of the Congress? After you have watched over these many months, when people in your party as well did not um, necessarily act as quickly as some Americans would have liked, what is your ask, sir? My ask will be laid out there in detail, but it relates to four things. Number one making sure we have all the money we need to get the vaccine to 300 million Americans at a minimum over the next year, the next calendar year, number one. Number two, making sure that all those people who are unemployed through no fault of their own because of the COVID crisis and small businesses and big businesses, et cetera, are shutting down, that they continue to be able to live day to day. They don't engage in food shortages. They're not in a position where they get thrown out of their homes. I would also be asking for a moratorium on being evicted from your homes for failure to pay rent, moratoriums on relating to the issue of whether or not your mortgage are being paid. Thirdly, I think it's critically important we provide all of the PPE as well as the direct payments to small businesses and others to be able to stay open, to be able to keep their people employed. That is something that's going to increase as time moves. And lastly, we're going to need to make sure that we're in a position that we can provide for the opportunity for people to begin to go back to work and get new jobs, developing infrastructure. Given the narrow majorities in the House and Senate, you've watched many administrations come and go. Do you believe that you will have a honeymoon to get things accomplished? I don't accomplished. think it's a honeymoon at all. I think it's a nightmare that everybody's going through, and they all say it's got to end. It's not a honeymoon. They're not doing me a favor. I'll ask you a rhetorical question I don't expect you to answer. And that is, do you think that Republicans who are losing their businesses, do you think Republican constituents out there who can't pay their mortgage, do you think they're not letting their Republican representatives know they got a problem? Do you think the person who just lost some, a family member and is worried about losing another one who happens to be a Republican, a staunch Republican, isn't telling his or her Republican senator or state representative, you've got to help, you've got to get something done? Do you think all those people who are making judgments of whether or not 
I'm, my child will be able to go to school and I have to stay home and I can't go to work, therefore I have no income, are all Democrats. I think there's just been a dawning here. And look, you have a different team in town. You have a different team in town. I'm not going to villainize the opposition, but I'm going to stand and say this is what we got to do because they know it. They know it. It's not like I'm saying what we want to do is we want to make sure that um, we are going to uh, um, sign a new uh, trade agreement with A, B, or C. This is life and death. That's why I believe we'll get it done. Sir, can I ask a follow-up to the Attorney General decision? Uh, you and President Obama selected Eric Holder on December 1st. Every recent president has selected their um, Attorney General by this point. What is taking you so long to make this critical decision? And do you believe that this is a time in the post-Trump era where you need someone who is not steeped in politics, who may have a life's work above or beyond politics? The answer is, first of all, we've gone, we've gone faster than everybody in the total cabinet. So we... Uh, not President Obama and yourself, sir. The whole cabinet? The whole cabinet. The whole cabinet? Well, there were a few missteps on commerce, as you remember, but... I, I do. I'm sure. I didn't want to raise them, though. Right. Um, but look, um, uh, this is... Uh, we're looking for uh, a team uh, who will instill the greatest confidence in the professionals at DOJ to know once again that there is no politics. There's no politics. As you know, there's been a great debate about in every single appointment whether or not people, there are enough African Americans, enough uh, Hispanics, enough Asian Pacific Americans, enough people who have, are new and young. So we're just working through it. It's not by design. There's not an obvious choice in my mind. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hi, Mr. President. Why? Hey. Um, you just spoke about uh, your confidence that there will it'll be possible to get things done once President Trump has left okay. office. Um, not, but no, it, excuse me, not just because he's left office, because it's all becoming obvious exactly what's at stake. Right, but. But even so, are you concerned about the effects long term that his presidency and, and now in the transition, his refusal to concede, his challenges to the election will have on American politics, will have on the Republican Party, especially if he does take the step of filing for re-election next month, or running to run in 2024? Um, you know, are, are you concerned about him lingering around? I know I see you smiling, but I saw to ask it, and um, kind of a corollary to that. Um, would you consider filing for re-election early next year to show that you're not going to be a lame duck? I'm not going to be a lame duck. Just watch me. Just watch me. I've been saying this from the very beginning. Look, let's just get the work. If, from this point on, for the next several years, there is one objective, and it's not my political future. It's bettering the circumstances for the average American. That's what it's all about. And I want to communicate to the American people what I hope they already understand about me. It's about them. It's not about me. It's not about me. And still, do you think that the climate will be different after President Trump than it was well, before? Well, we'll see. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a fortune teller, but I can tell you that uh, the calls I've gotten from sitting Republicans in powerful positions they know me. They know I level with them. They know I never mislead. They know I tell them the truth. And they know I don't go out of my way to try to embarrass. Um, and in terms of the transition, are there areas where the Trump team has not been cooperative that um, have not been made public? We've heard a bit about the issues at the, the Pentagon last week. Um, are there other areas that you think the public should be aware of? There are other areas. I'm not sure it's relevant whether the public should be aware of. Look, what I'm trying to do is pull together the political parties that are in the Congress that know that we're facing four serious crises. And we have to address all of them. None of us can get all we want, but we can make real progress. And so my focus is on uniting, not emphasizing the divisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President-elect. 
Um, Russia, as you said, is suspected of uh, carrying out this massive cyber hack. Um, you said it happened under President Donald Trump's watch, but of course, in January 21, it will then, of course, land on your doorstep. My question is, what are the... Wait, wait, let's get something straight. will land on my doorstep. His failure will land on my doorstep. Yes. Okay. What are the practical implications of overseeing a government where experts say it could take years to know where the hackers went and years to remove them? How can you ensure that, that the systems will be safe given what experts are saying? I can't ensure, but I can demand, based on the experts both here and among our allies, what is needed to find that out. It may cost literally billions of dollars to secure our cyberspace. It may take a great deal to get it done. First and foremost, it takes people who are knowledgeable and vigilant about what is happening and how it's happening. And so I'm just going to do all that need be done, all that need be done to determine, A, the extent of the damage, B, the nature of how it occurred, C, what I should be doing internally in terms of my administration to protect against it in the future, and number four, getting together with our allies to try to set up an international system of what constitutes appropriate behavior in cyberspace and get us all to get to the point where we hold all hold any other country liable for their breaking out of those basic rules. And just to be clear at the top of that, did you say you couldn't ensure that the systems would be safe when you came into office then? Of course I can't. I don't know what the state of them is. They're clearly not safe right now. And then between now and January 20th, the likelihood of my being able to garner all the information, the extent and depth of the violations, exactly how the codes or how it were breached, what was breached, what was done, is not within my power to do that. But it will be an overwhelming focus for my administration. And my other question is on immigration. Um, yes. I was just reading about the fact that Officials in your transition, Jake Sullivan, Susan Rice, they say you won't be immediately rolling back Trump immigration policies. And I, I stress immediately, um, there are some immigration advocates who say, why not roll back the Remain in Mexico policy? Why not roll back the um, asylum restrictions? What is your timeline for rolling back some of the specific Trump administration immigration policies? I've already started discussing these issues with the president of Mexico and our friends in Latin America. Um, and the timeline is to do it so that we, in fact, make it better, not worse. The last thing we need is to say we're going to stop immediately the, uh, you know, uh, the access to asylum the way it's being run now and end up with uh, two million people on our border. Um, it's a matter of setting up the guardrails so we can move in the direction. I will accomplish what I said I would do a much more humane policy based on family unification, but it requires getting a lot in place and requires getting the funding to get it in place, including just asylum judges, for example. So it's a matter of it will get done, and it will get done quickly, but it's not going to be able to be done on day one, lift every restriction that exists and find out that and go back to what it was 20 years ago and all of a sudden find out we have a crisis on our hand that complicates what we're trying to do. Would you say to immigration, what would you say to immigration advocates then who say maybe you're possibly dragging your feet to and it might take too long? Or you, it sounds like you're saying I you say, need Trust to be patient. Me, look yeah. at me. I've never told them anything I haven't done. I'm working with them now. We're dealing with some of those very organizations as we speak. And I will do what I said. It's going to take not day one. It's going to take probably the next six months to put that in place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. God love you, man. You, you're a one-horse pony. I tell you. Thank you. Thank you. I promise you, my Justice Department will be totally on its own making its judgments about how they should proceed. Thank you.